Tuesday. Welcome back to another episode of The Practice. The show is a look into my digital art workflow. I'm Stuart. I'm a 3D artist, illustrator, animator, and your pal. And I'm excited to have you back for another episode this week. As you can see in the recording so far, we are making a very simple little character out of a handful of spheres and a sweep. A couple other little very simple bits of geometry. The idea here is to create an ultra simple little character. And then we're going to use these some of the sort of presets in the animation uh, palette and a really simple deformer and we're going to add you know a ton of life, a ton of personality and we're going to sort of lean into some of the principles of animation to improve like a rather simple uh, movement in this character here. So I'm going to spend the first you know, small section of this recording, just doing the, the character itself, which is, you know, as I mentioned, just a, really a handful of spheres here, a couple of eyes and a simple sweep for a mouth. I am turning the polygons up a bit in these, uh, in these spheres because we're going to be squashing and stretching this bad boy a bit. So we want to uh, make sure that there's plenty of subdivisions there for some nice smooth uh, distortion or, or uh, yeah, distortion of the elements. So adding a little nose here, and that's just about as far as I'm going to take the character. Um, this really isn't so much about the character as it is about sort of the, the principles of the animation here. Um, so the idea is once we get this guy set up in a very simple scene, we're going to create just a couple of keyframes for the animation and then we're going to exaggerate some some components of it and like I mentioned to add a ton of life and personality into the animation itself. Uh, with the texturing here what I'm doing is using the luminance channel with the same color as the the color channel just giving it you know 15 or 20 percent luminance just to fill it in a little bit and make it appear a little bit flatter and more simplified. Kind of like the effect there. It's fun sometimes you can use just 100% luminance and no color or no diffusion really. They call it they call it the color channel in Cinema 4D, but it's really like the diffusion channel, and that's really the simple uh, the simple shading you get on it on a 3D object. It comes from the diffusion, but the um, pure luminance will be a uh, you know a much flatter look. So anyway, we're getting into the animation here, and as you can see, it's just two simple keyframes. Um, we're going up and down, we're creating this like bouncing ball effect, right? But what I did is I went into layout and animation, and what I can do here is select the frames at the end of the movement and use some of the presets uh, that are located sort of in the middle section across, uh, you know, just above the, uh, the timeline there. And I can remove the... Um, like the, there's a little tab that says uh, remove overshoot. We're gonna click that off. And what that does is it allows for a little bit more of a natural movement. It, you know, when, when the object reaches the height of its movement, it's gonna continue just a little bit past there and it's going to um, sort of exaggerate and, and uh, slow down that transition. Um, and sort of like, you know, in, in the old school cartoons when Wile E. Coyote went, you know, hurling up in the air, he would sort of pause at the height of his movement and he would kind of blink or do something silly and then start dropping again. And what we're doing here is working to really exaggerate that up and down motion. The other thing we did is we added a squash and stretch deformer into the hierarchy of this uh, character group. And what that allows us to do is very simply uh, pull up and pull, you know, push down the height of the object and sort of squash, squash it, squash it, and stretch it in a really realistic, uh, natural way. 
So I was just messing with the background color there, but we'll, we'll get into playing with this a bit further. And you can see already that we've got um, this, this sort of squashing effect at the bottom of the, of the uh, movement. And we've got this elongating effect at the top of the movement, which adds a lot of, of sort of natural feel to it. Um, and it's really simple to do that with squash and stretch. What you want to do is you want to get squash and stretch inside your hierarchy, or if you're using it just with one object, you put it as a child of that object. And you, you make sure that the height of the squash and stretch deformer matches the height of the object. There's also a little button there that says, like, match, uh, what does it say? It's a little toggle. It says match uh, object height or match parent height is what it says. And if you click that, or fit to parent is what it says. If you, if you click fit to parent, it'll uh, match the PSR and make it a lot easier to position that. And that's what I did here, and then made it just slightly taller so it would account for um, some of the overlap and exaggeration of the uh, of the secondary spheres. You'll see that I'm, I'm moving those just a little bit in the height of the bounce. And then you, I don't really mess with um, most of the settings inside of squash and stretch. What I really mess with is, I think it's called the factor. And that's what really gives us most of our pulling and squashing. And so I really just, I, I add, you know, 10% upwards in the height of the, anim of the bouncing animation. And I pull it down another 10% um, at the bottom. And that gives us that, that squash when we hit the ground. And then I keyframe it and make sure it's, it's at about 100% um, in the middle of the animation where he needs to be in a more neutral position because he's neither at the top of or at the bottom of that movement. So I go from, you know, around 90 at the bottom to around 100 in the middle to about 110 at the top. And that'll all depend on your specific character and, and the look exactly you're going for. But um, a little bit will go a long way. Now, once I get that squash and stretch the way I'm kind of feeling it, You'll notice the other thing I'm going to start doing is uh, changing the position of some of the facial features and some of the secondary balls in, or secondary spheres in the, uh, in the character itself. And that's kind of like, you know, the Wile E. Coyote effect. As he reaches the pinnacle of his height, you'll notice that, like, his features might sort of exaggerate upwards slightly. Some things might sort of elongate or, or move around in position. So... What I'm doing is, you know, you know, the eyes and the nose and mouth, once we get towards the top of our animation, I'll scoot those facial features up just a hair and keyframe them up uh, so that they will move upwards slightly towards the top of the movement. And you can see what I just did there was have the eyes uh, squish down into a thinner, wider position at the bottom, which again exaggerates that sort of compression at the bottom of the animation. So you can see there, he's awfully squished and his eyes sort of close, which makes it a lot more interesting and adds a lot of character to that motion. And you'll see here, um, making the eyes just 20% taller towards the top of the motion. And I'll also go ahead and, and change the position of those ever so slightly. And these, these types of subtle movements can be a little tricky to see in the time-lapse version of this animation. But you'll see towards the end here, I'll have the character on loop at his normal speed. And I want you to really pay attention to some of those subtle shifts and some of the differences that you see, um, some of the, the slight movements, the, the slight exaggerations that you see in the animation. And think about how, like what sort of character and interest it adds to the motion. There's a lot of, of really powerful stuff you can achieve using the deformers in Cinema 4D. And I, I may try to create more videos to sort of highlight those, uh, those features. So 
Here I'm compiling frames in Photoshop. I'm just going to put together a, a rather simple GIF animation. So when I get all my frames going, I like to create a group of those so they're a little bit more manageable and then do some of my editing on top of that. Now there's some weird, um, there's some weird stuff happening in the shadows. So what I thought about doing was masking out some of the, the shadows um, from the animation. And that also keeps the GIF file size down. But I decided that there was so much change there, it really wasn't worth the effort. So I, I it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't feeling right. So I decided to move away from that approach and just really darken some of those shadows, make them a deeper red. And that helped alleviate some of the, the noise that was happening in the shadows there. What I did was, since it's really a sort of an experiment, I didn't crank my settings super high when I exported the final animation. So there was some noise and some artifacting and some weirdness happening uh, in, the, in the sort of shaded areas themselves. But I decided to live with it. It's still pretty fun. I think I could have alleviated some of that just with the position of the secondary fill light in the scene. As you'll see, that's really what's casting that dark red shadow, but it's fun. It looks pretty cool. I'm pleased with it. So thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoy the final result here. Uh, if you like what you saw, please hit like and subscribe. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate to hit me up in the comments below. If you want to keep up with the work that I'm doing, hit me up on Instagram at DLGNCE. And until next time, excited to see you next week. Stuart saying goodbye. Cheers.